وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المطهرين المكرمين Brothers and sisters, salam alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. For many people, it was one of the most inspiring moments when they recall what happened on the 10th of Muharram, 61 years after the migration of the Holy Prophet in the land of Karbala. For we are told in historical records that a man by the name of Abis emerged in the battlefield and began confronting the army of the Umayyad Caliph Yazid but with a different mindset. We are told in narrations that he began to remove his body armor until many questioned his actions. He responded by saying famously that the love of Hussein ibn Ali has made me insane. And that may be misunderstood by some, whilst many appreciate the extent of the devotion that this individual displayed for the grandson of the Holy Prophet. Perhaps people ask, what drives individuals to react in such a manner, where they would neglect the external circumstances, provided they feel so passionate, so determined about a particular matter, that they have perhaps heard or been inspired by. And when we look at the Holy Quran, we find a similar occurrence in relation to the magicians at the time of Prophet Musa, peace and blessings be upon him, when they had been present at the confrontation after being ordered by Fir'aun. We discussed their so to speak, acceptance of the path of monotheism, their devotion, how they immediately fell in prostration when they saw the miracle that Prophet Musa salam performed before them by the permission of the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. And interestingly, in Surah, in chapter 26, verse number 50, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, after Fir'aun said to them that I am going to punish you in such a manner, they responded by saying, قَالُوا لَا ضَيْرْ إِنَّا إِلَىٰ رَبِّنَا مُنْقَلِبُونَ We don't care. We are going to return to our Lord. It's as if they've been somehow numbed from any impact that anyone could have upon them. They said, well, you could do whatever you want. We are actually going back to our Lord. Now, in Surah Taha, as we discussed, several verses talk about the magicians and what they said after they had embraced the path of Tawheed, the path of Islam. And the last one was 73, as we discussed last week. Now, in verse 74 of chapter 20, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues by saying, إِنَّهُ مَنْ يَأْتِي رَبَّهُ مُجْرِمًا فَإِنَّ لَهُ جَهَنَّمْ لَا يَمُوتُ فِيهَا وَلَا يَحْيَا Now, the first question is, this verse, the verse that follows it, 75 and 76, are all words of guidance for mankind. That the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us some instruction, some information. Who is it that said this? The magicians? Or is it now that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying this? This is one point that the Mufassirin are are discussing. So, who is it that said, إِنَّهُ مَنْ يَأْتِي رَبَّهُ مُجْرِمًا Was it that the actual magician said this when they were continuing with their expression of repentance? Or is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now has ended the discussion of the magicians and now this is part of the Holy Quran revelation? Some of the Mufassirin have said, yes, these are the words of the magicians because the إِنَّهُ somehow f follows from what they were saying before. But the vast majority of the Quranic exegists actually say no. Why? Because the meanings found in these three verses, 74 to 76, are quite deep and they're quite rich. And it's unlikely that the magicians who maybe half an hour before were saying by the might and the glory of Pharaoh, now they're talking to this extent that they're saying that in Jahannam there is no death, there is no life. They're talking about paradise, they're talking about 
the importance of purification and so on. These are quite important directions, words of guidance. And it seems that there is more possibility that these, this is not the words of the magicians, but rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, providing guidance as the Holy Quran does. Now, the verse says, whoever comes to his Lord, innahu mayyati rabbah. What does this refer to? Of course, this refers to the day of judgment. And the idea that has to be understood by people, especially believers, is that the human beings are judged on the state that they leave this world. This is quite crucial. The Quran continuously emphasizes this. It is not about how you spend your life. It is about how you meet your Lord. What's the difference? Well, you might find people who have spent 70 years of their lives in uh, disbelief, they may have uh, committed acts of aggression against their Lord or against human beings, but they die in the state of purity after repenting, for example, such as Hur ibn Yazid al Riyahi, such as these magicians themselves, that perhaps they did not live long after. Uh, they had submitted to Allah and Pharaoh said, now I will execute you all. Now I will punish you. I will sever your right uh, arms and your left leg as we dis discussed and I will crucify you. They didn't live much long, but they, throughout their lives they had considered Pharaoh as their Lord, isn't it? So the idea that emerges from this and many other verses in the Holy Quran is that there is a return to God. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. We are from Allah and to him we shall return. And this particular return, the state of the human being's heart is what the human being will be judged upon. يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ On that day, if you have wealth and you have many children, it will be not helpful. Except if you come to God with that pure heart, with that submissive heart, with that heart which the Prophet and the Ahl al-Bayt have said and clearly defined the Qalbu salim as the heart which has nothing except God, except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning that throughout the human being's life that has been the focus for their journey, this involuntary journey that you and I conduct. Because scholars of mysticism, irfan, spirituality, they talk about this voluntary journey and involuntary journey. They say that every human being undertakes this involuntary journey, which is characterized by this verse, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. But there is also an option to go through a voluntary journey. That's the journey of purification. That's the journey of self refinement reflection, introspection, to seek guidance from the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala to purify one's heart so that when we meet him in the, uh, the, the Quranic description, we meet him in the best possible state. Now, the Quran tells us here that whoever comes to Allah in the state of jurm, innahu may yati rabbahu mujrima. The Quran in 52 occasions, 5 2 occasions, talks about this concept of mujrim, mujrimin, ijram. It's widespread in the holy book. You find that the definition that is often given to this particular word is committing acts which are considered criminal. So in the Arabic language, a mujrim is a criminal person, a person who is guilty of committing acts which has violated the law, so to speak. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in 52 occasions speaks about mujrim, mujrimin, ijram. For example, uh, in, uh, in chapter 7 verse 40, beautifully, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَذَّبُوا بِآيَاتِنَا وَاسْتَكْبَرُوا عَنْهَا لَا تُفَتَّحُ لَهُمْ أَبْوَابَ السَّمَاءِ Those who deny our signs and are arrogant about it, Allah will not open up for them the gates of the heavens. Then he says, وَلَا يَدْخُلُونَ الْجَنَّةِ They will never enter paradise until حَتَّى يَلِجَ الْجَمَلْ فِي سَمِّ الْخِيَاطِ Until the camel enters into the head of the pin. When does that happen? 
when a camel, when can a camel enter into the head? You see, you know, I'm not going to say sisters only. Brothers and sisters, you see the, the, the pin, you know, that you use for sewing or whatever. It has a small, tiny head, which you, th you put the thread, you put the a small, yes, thread in order to, uh, for example, knit something. Allah says, they will not enter Jannah until the camel goes through that hole, small, tiny hole. Means they will not enter Jannah. Um, it's using the example of the camel and the needle and the head because the people are used to it at that time. Likewise, you have, for example, in chapter 10, verse 17, in Nahu la yuflihul mujrimun, a mujrim will never be successful. Allah says in chapter 74, beautifully, if we want to know uh, the, and you know, each word in the Quran is an ocean. If you open it up, you drown in the sea of the wonderful meanings of the holy book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But intriguingly, this mujrim or ijram is interesting because it's been repeated so many times. If you ask a question, what characterizes a mujrim, a criminal in the eyes of God? And in the, in the Quran, uh, one particular description is found here in uh, Surah Al-Muddathir Al in chapter 74. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, on the day of judgment, and we have referred to these verses before in the, in the previous sessions, but it's always useful to refer back to them again, that Allah says, on the day of judgment, the people of Jannah will ask about whom? Fi jannatin yatasa'aluna anil mujrimeen. In Jannah, can you imagine? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of the people of paradise that Allah says they will ask about a group of people who are considered criminals. Mujrimin, yatasa'alun, where are they? Where have they ended? And uh, Allah then reveals to these people in Jannah where these mujrimin are. They're in hell. Many, the verses in the Quran where it talks about ijram normally speaks about their destination being, or their, the outcome being, punishment and chastisement in Jahannam. Now, يَتَسَاءَلُونَ عَنِ mujrimin. Allah gives them a chance to speak to them. So they're in Jannah, they speak to the mujrimin in Jahannam. What do they say to them? قَالُوا مَا سَلَكَكُمْ أو مَا سَلَكَكُمْ فِي سَقَرْ They ask, why are you in hell? Meaning what? They're surprised they're being punished. Saqar is a name given to hellfire, one of the names that the Qur'an gives to hellfire. They respond. Who are they responding? The mujrimin, the criminal ones, the wretched ones, the guilty ones. They say, قَالُوا لَمْ نَكُمْ مِنَ الْمُصَلِّينَ We did not establish prayers. وَلَمْ نَكُمْ نُطْعِمُ الْمِسْكِينَ And we did not engage in serving the community by helping the poor and the needy. وَكُنَّا نَخُوضُ مَعَ الْخَائِضِينَ We used to waste our time going with the flow. Meaning what? Meaning any group of people who kind of told us, come join us, take part in an activity, we just went with them. Whichever group we felt peer pressure with, we just went with them. Yes? And وَكُنَّا نُكَذِّبُ بِيَوْمِ الدِّينَ this nukadhib doesn't necessarily mean we denied or we called it a lie, but we didn't necessarily take it seriously, the day of judgment. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives here four characteristics of a, a mujrim. However, when it comes to the mufassireen, they say, well, in today's terminology, a mujrim is someone who's committed a crime. But the greatest crime in the eyes of God is to deny Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to die in that state. In other words, to reject the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala, to reject the prophets and to die in that state. So they say the main mujrim in the eyes of God, according to all the verses in the Quran, if we put them together, is likely to be an individual who is non-believer, who has been presented with the guidelines, with the guidance, with the instructions, and has arrogantly denied it and rejected it. That is a mujrim in the Quranic uh, uh, understanding. Because, of course, that's the biggest crime, to reject the Almighty, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, going back to the verse, Allah says, whoever, whoever comes to him in the state of being a criminal, 
then Jahannam is their result. However, what's interesting about it, it says, La yamutu fiha wa la yahya. Brothers and sisters, there's so much that can be said about hellfire, isn't it? God forbid, and it's not for the purposes of scaring people. Often when we talk about Jahannam, people say, why are you talking about things that put fear in the hearts of individuals? Well, the reality is the Quran examines Jahannam and hellfire to the extent that many people will not be comfortable with. And some might seemingly go for the pessimistic view. But the Quran gives a balance, talks about Jannah and of course talks about Jahannam too. Yet one of the most, and arguably perhaps the most difficult element about Jahannam is the fact that there is no death. You might say, why? Because, you know, in this life you'll suffer if you are, God forbid, being put into some state of torment or punishment. But there is an end to your limit to how much you can take. You basically leave this world. Or what happens to you? You become unconscious. Yes? We have seen and heard of the uh, stories of people being tortured in different ways in many prisons around the world. Eventually, they reach a point where they fall unconscious. The, the body switches off anymore. Allah says in Jahannam, that state is not there. You can't feel any respite. You won't feel any respite. There is no way out in the sense of the continuous punishment. So, لا يموت فيها ولا يحيا. There is no death, there is no life. In other words, life after death. And there is an interesting hadith which I found in many sources, Sunni and Shia, which supports the verse in chapter 4, verse 56. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِآيَاتِنَا سَوْفَ نُصْلِيهِمْ نَارًا That whomsoever denies our signs, we will punish them with Jahannam. كُلَّمَا نَضِجَتْ جُلُودُهُمْ بَدَّنَّاهُمْ جُلُودًا غَيْرَهَا لِيَذُوقُ الْعَذَابِ Every time their flesh and their skin are burnt, we immediately replace it with another layer so that they are continuously tasting punishment. So people might think, okay, you know what? This body of mine has a mass. This mass is burnt. Normally in a fire that, God forbid, if you've seen images of people being put to fire here, they will turn into, you know, the charred, you know, substance eventually. Allah says, no, in Jahannam, there is a mechanism where the flesh and the skin are continuously being refreshed. Now, the hadith from Imam al-Baqir in Bihar says, إِذَا أَدْخَلَ اللَّهُ أَهْلَ الْجَنَّةِ الْجَنَّةِ When the people of Jannah are in Jannah. وَأَهْلَ النَّارِ النَّارِ When everything is finished. So the accountability and the measure is complete. People are in heaven and people are in hell. جِئَ بِالْمَوْتِ Death comes. In what way? فِي صُورَةٍ it comes in the state of a sheep or a calf, like an animal, for example. حتى يقف بين الجنة والنار It will stand between heaven and hell. So the people of heaven will see it and the people of hell will see this animal, which represents death. قال ثم ينادي منادي Someone will call. يَسْمَعُ أَهْلَ الدَّارَيْنِ Both uh, people of Jannah and, and Jahannam will hear it. يَا أَهْلَ الْجَنَّةِ يَا أَهْلَ النَّارِ Or the people of heaven or the people of hell. When they hear it, the caller will say, أَتَدْرُونَ مَا هَذَا Do you know what this is? هَذَا هُوَ الْمَوْتِ أَلَّذِي كُنْتُمْ تَخَافُونَ مِنْهُ فِي الدُّنْيَا This is death that you used to be petrified from in dunya. Then the people of Jannah, when they see this animal and they're told this is death, what do they say? They immediately pray to God, Allahumma la tadkhul al-mawta alayna. Oh Allah, we don't want death. We're happy here in Jannah. We don't want death die anymore. Very interestingly, the hadith says, وَيَقُولُ أَهْلُ النَّارِ The people of hell will say, Allahumma adkhul al-mawta alayna. Oh Allah, please, we want to die. Then the course says, ثُمَّ يُذْبَحُ كَمَا تُذْبَحُ الشَّاتِ The animal will be slaughtered, just like an animal is slaughtered, according to the riwayah. 
ثم ينادي مناد لا موت أبدا أيقنوا بالخلود There is no more death Live for eternity Live for eternity فيفرح أهل الجنة فرحا لو كان أحد يومئذ يموت من فرح لماتوا The people of Jannah will be so happy that if ever there will be someone who dies because of their happiness, they would die. In other words, in this world. And likewise, the people of hell will be so unhappy and grieving that if you were to, able to die because of the grieving, you would die. So, I remember having a discussion last week with a few youngsters. They asked me about, you know, music, girlfriend, boyfriend, and so on and so forth. One very powerful realization, if the human being sits down and thinks about it, is this. It's not worth wasting and committing these acts for 70, 80 years, whatever, even maybe not to that uh, age. On the way here, I heard a brother from our community, Shia community in Dallas yesterday, uh, on Sunday, he was uh, driving in the motorway. A car hit a pole. He's 28 years of age. A, a car hit a pole, and this is, a, you know, the light pole. It hit it, and he was driving. It wasn't his fault. This particular pole fell on his car. Ila rahmatillah. 28. It wasn't his fault. And some people say, okay, drive carefully. We may not read 70, 80, yes? But let's say people read 70, 80, 90. When Allah says there is khulud, there is eternity, is it worth it to one waste or put and compromise one's life for eternal happiness or eternal damnation, God forbid? And you know, the human being, once they put their minds to it, they can come to one clear conclusion. And if they don't, they need to re-examine time and time again, what am I doing in comparison to what awaits me? So Allah says, لا يموت فيها ولا يحيا. Then He says, وَمَن يَأْتِهِ مُؤْمِنًا Whomsoever comes to God on the day of judgment with two things, iman and good deeds. قَدْ عَمِلَ الصَّالِحَاتِ فَأُولَٰئِكَ لَهُمُ الدَّرَجَاتُ الْأُولَىٰ For them, there is the highest status of paradise, of course, as the Quran describes it to be the lofty status, the one that everybody is seeking. Now, before going into a discussion about Jannah to Adn, because you see this often described, what is the gardens of Eden, I'd like to draw your attention to a very intriguing subject in the Quran, which I'm going to just simply talk about for a couple of minutes, because it requires an in-depth analysis and perhaps we can refer to it on another occasion. And that is the whole subject of meeting God. Allah. I've counted 25 times in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you will meet me. You know, meetings are a very important part of people's lives, isn't it? We meet different individuals, sometimes for professional basis, sometimes it's for leisure. Sometimes we meet our family members. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Holy Quran, وَعْلَمُوا أَنَّكُمْ مُلَاقُوهُ In chapter 2, verse 223. Know that you're definitely going to meet him. Yes? Allah says in chapter 6, verse 31, قَدْ خَسِرَ الَّذِينَ كَذَّبُوا بِلِقَاءِ اللَّهِ Those who say, no, I'm not going to meet God, are the losers. If they deny this meeting with God, in, uh, you find in chapter 18, verse 110, so the last verse, verse of Surah Al-Kahf, just in between brackets, this last verse, according to the narrations of the Ahl al-Bayt, it's recommended to recite this verse before we sleep. That this verse will help, and according to the riwayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will appoint an angel that will wake the human being to the, at the time of their choosing. This verse concludes with the idea of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُوا لِقَاءَ رَبِّهِ 
فليعمل عملا صالحا هم سوى ذا وونتس تو ميت ذا لورد ليت ذيم بيرفورم جود ديدز ولا يشرك بعباده ربه احدا اند ماست نوت اسوسييت اني ون ايلس ويز جاد So, you know, the idea of sincerity and ikhlas and so on. It's very interesting that people ask the question, what kind of meeting is this? Of course, we deny categorically and reject any suggestion of anthropomorphism, tashbih, tatsim, meaning that we will meet God and he's sitting on a particular throne and it's a physical meeting. There is nothing like him. And the Ahl al-Bayt have denounced and come down hard on suggestions of placing physical attributes or human-like attributes to God. We do not accept this under any circumstances. Yes? So, people ask, but the Quran in all these occasions over 25 times says we will meet God. And, Ya ayyuhal insan, innaka kadihun ila rabbika kadhan you will meet him. It's 100%. There is no doubt about it. What is this meeting? How will this meeting take place? What will be the logistics of this particular meeting? This is a very intriguing area that requires a lot of thought. It's a fascinating subject that has intrigued the minds of the Mufassireen, the theologians, the mystics, and many ideas have been presented about this. But perhaps it can be summarized as the fact that it is meeting the promise of God, meeting the the direction or what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to do. In other words, when you say that I am meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is the journey towards Him in fulfillment of the objective of creation, in fulfillment of the objective of what, what we are here for. And with that, we can understand that this particular meeting is in reference to the Day of Judgment. There is no doubt about that, that that takes place in the Day of Judgment. But with no doubt that it's not a physical one, but more so one that allows the human beings to present their life and whether they have that has fulfilled what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from them or not. But it certainly gives importance and significance to the Day of Judgment, isn't it? Because the Day of Judgment is the day of that liqa, is the day of that particular so-called meeting. Now, here we find the final verse speaking about Jannatu Adnan, Tajri min tahtiha al-anharu khalidina fiha. In 11 times in the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about these gardens, Jannatu Adn. You find it, for example, in Surah Maryam. You find it in Surah An-Nahl, chapter 18, uh, Surah Al-Kahf. In these instances, the reference is found with regards to Jannah to Adn. In Arabic, Adn refers to something which is continuous, something which is stable and firm. Al-Istiqrar, Al-Baqa, Al-Iqama. So. Mufassireen have said that when Allah says Jannah to Adnin, it is in reference to a fact, a reality, that this place is eternal. This place is not transient. It is not short-lived. It is there forever. And when you enter Jannah, you never leave. Once a, a young child said, asked me in a, question, in a, in a discussion about Jannah, because it's amazing, when you talk to youngsters about paradise, their imagination goes wild. And they start questioning all these kind of things. They, they, can't, they can't somehow fathom the idea that you can have whatever you want. Yeah? And you can have rivers of whatever you want. Although Allah says, you'll, you'll have rivers underneath. As this verse says, uh, uh, Yes, people say, okay, what kind of things can I have in this river? And so the children came up with all kinds of interesting uh, um, questions. And one of them was, if I wanted to leave paradise, can I do that? I don't want to stay in it. Can I do that? Well, the answer is that thought would never even come to your mind. Because there's no boredom in Jannah. There is no repetition in Jannah. There is absolute enjoyment and freedom all the time in Jannah. There's no excrement. There's no day and night. There's no working. There is no ibadah. There's no waking up 
Fafajr and so on and so forth that so many people seem to struggle with, yes? All these things are not there. So the human being is, and I said this to the children, I said, look, all you're doing is relaxing or in the youth terminology, chillaxing. <laughs> or doing whatever you wish to do. There's nothing that bounds you or, or restricts you or gives you the inclination that you don't want to remain in this particular existence. The notion is that it is sy synonymous with eternal living, this Jannatu Adin. However, of course, this is in relation to the fact that if you go to a garden in dunya, it's open to being what? It's open to being affected by external factors. So the trees may fall. You have the wind. You have, for example, if, it's, if it doesn't receive enough nourishment, water, and so on, you wouldn't necessarily see it as a garden. Whereas Allah says, no, that Jannah, it will not be affected by any circumstances as we know it, the external circumstances that this dunya is set for. Yet some say, some of the Mufassireen, they say, hold on a minute. Many of these verses that talk about Jannah, uh, jannah to Adin also talk about Khalidina Fiha, like this. If Adin means something that you're forever, so why is Allah saying you will be staying there forever? This notion of eternity should not be next to Adin if Adin means eternal place of abode. Yeah? So they've said there are narrations that point to this place in Jannah which is special. It's a very high, lofty place and perhaps the highest degree of Jannah. Because we have narrations that the degrees of Jannah are equal to the number of verses in the Qur'an. So there are more than 6,000 verses in the Qur'an. <laughs> there are perhaps more than 6,000 stations or degrees in Jannah. Although it's difficult to limit Jannah. That's in a way limiting this existence. Perhaps it's to make the idea clear in our mind. It's supported by a number of very interesting narrations. The Prophet of Islam, Rasul al Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. He says, at, as is narrated, he says, Adin Darullah. Adin is a place that belongs to Allah. Everything belongs to Allah. But like how certain days, Quran says, actually belong to God specifically, Perhaps in paradise there are special places. He says, The eyes have never comprehended it. The mind has never thought about it. Three groups of people will live in this place. Who? The prophets, the ones who are truthful, meaning the imams, and the ones who are either the martyrs or more likely the witnesses. Because the Quran, the Quran does never use the word shaheed for martyrdom. Everywhere in the Quran, when Allah used the word shahada or shuhada, it refers to people who are witnesses. Because for example, وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ قُتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتًا Not shuhada, yes? But the word shahada for martyrdom has been somehow extrapolated from the fact that these people have witnessed and have been witness to the promise of God. So that's why they're given the term shaheed. However, here it's in reference perhaps, and Allah knows best in this narration, to the witnesses. But an interesting hadith is found in Kitab al-Khisal for Shaykh al-Sadur. From the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him and his prolific progeny, says, Man sarrahu an yahya hayati wa yamuta mamati. Whomsoever wishes to live in accordance to my life and to die the way I died, so to speak, وَيَسْكُنْ جَنَّتِي أَلَّتِي وَعَدَنِ اللَّهُ رَبِّي And to be living in the part of Jannah that Allah has promised me I will be in. Jannah to Adin. Then he says, he said, the, word, the hadith has the word Jannah to Adin, where I will be in Jannah. In other words, the Holy Prophet of Islam. Then he says, what should you do? فَلْيُوَالِ عَلَيَّ بْنَ أَبِي طَالِبْ وَذُرِّيَّتَهُ مِنْ بَعْدِي they must follow Ali ibn Abi Talib and his progeny after me. So they take this particular narration, 
plus several others, some of the theologians, some of the Mufassirin, and say, it's a place in Jannah that is the highest level and is also where the Prophet of Islam, as well as the Ahl al-Bayt salam and, and, and the Prophets generally are residing. Question, if you do this and you follow the Ahl al-Bayt, the best of ability, can we be with the Prophet exactly in Jannah, in the same place, attaining the same what the Prophet and the Imams attain? It's unlikely. It's unlikely. But what does this refer to then? Or oh, the Quran talks about for Ulaika Ma'alladina and Amallahu Alayhim, whomsoever follows Allah and the Messenger, then Allah raises them with Siddiqina wa Shuhada, Nabiina wa Siddiqina wa Shuhada, wa Hasuna Ulaika Rafiq. It refers to the idea of being able to see them, visit them, spend time with them. That's not open to everyone. We need special permission in Jannah to be able to meet the Prophet, to be able to spend time with the Imams and the other Prophets. So it refers with this idea that if you follow them as to the best of your ability and die in that particular state, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may give you that opportunity to interact with them on the Day of Judgment. And of course, this is one understanding and Allah knows best. This is not a conclusive uh, uh, way we can talk about that element. But the Quran then says, وَذَلِكَ جَزَاءُ مَنْ You see, this part is one of so many verses of the Quran that's clear evidence for anyone who has the unfortunately either misguided or ignorant to say it is sufficient just to follow and love the Ahl al-Bayt and not necessarily wajib to do the obligatory deeds. Because I tell you, it is something that is there. I was, was invited to recite a majlis in one particular city. I'm not naming the city. And when I was uh, invited in the month of uh, Ramadan, they said to me, can you please talk about the importance of praying? I said, that's unusual. Normally we talk about how to attain concentration in prayers, how to make our prayers accepted by Allah. What, well, the importance of praying? Why? They said, well, we'll have to be honest with you. There are a number of, we have a group in our mosque, in our center, that they say that just loving and following Ali ibn Abi Talib is sufficient. On the day of judgment, that's enough. Yes? This is not 1400 years ago. This is only a few years ago. And when I was invited again the year after, they said, can you talk about the importance of fasting? I said, okay, what's the problem now? They said, it's because the same group now says, well, we have this hadith, which is not a hadith, by the way. Kullu yawmin ashura wa kullu ardin karbala. Every day is ashura and every land is karbala. They said, well, you know what? If it's every day is ashura and we're not supposed to fast in ashura, therefore we won't fast in Ramadan. Can you imagine? To that extent, you find the people justifying wrong deeds by going through righteous people or using the names of righteous people, such as the Ahl al-Bayt Allah says here, وَذَلِكَ جَزَاءُ مَنْ تَزَكَّى nafs self-purification, jihadun nafs is what's required. And what helps you to do this? The Qur'an and the Ahl al-Bayt. That's the goal as it's been defined, isn't it? Constant purification. قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا Yes, as the Quran says. قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ تَزَكَّى As the Quran says. Why? Why do we need to purify our souls? Because throughout our lives we pick up many pollutants, don't we? The temptations throughout our lives, the slip-ups. We need to wash. We need to purify. We need to cleanse. And Allah says, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ وَذَلِكَ جَزَاءُ مَنْ تَزَكَّى That's the reward of those who are indeed striving for self-purification. Now, these are three verses which somehow conclude that stage of the magicians, their submission, and what happened to them. The next verse, however, goes towards the movement of Musa السلام, with Bani Israel, towards Palestine and the saving of the children of Israel from Fir'aun and the drowning of Fir'aun. 
But I thought, you know, that there's a, a few years, according to Riwayat um, events, that Surah Taha does not refer to. And other chapters of the Qur'an refer to, and that's the beauty of the Qur'an. It focuses on certain areas. But for us to have an, a nice idea about what happened afterwards, I thought it would be interesting to look at this element and to um, try and somehow uh, have a broader image of what, it, what actually happened. Now, here in chapter 7, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in verse 119 talks about the submission of the uh, magicians and how they responded in such a way to Musa alayhi salam. But it uses another term and it says, They became so kind of humbled by this particular experience. They, of course, went into prostration. They said, we believe in our Lord and the Lord of the worlds, the Lord of Musa and Harun. Fir'aun then threatened them as we uh, discussed in Surah Taha. All this is, uh, is something we have covered. Here in verse 126, uh, it's interesting. The, the, the magicians say to Fir'aun, you know what you're doing? You are just simply taking revenge on us because we believed. We haven't done anything wrong. We just believed in God. But then they turn to Allah. رَبَّنَا أَفْرِغْ عَلَيْنَا صَبْرًا وَتَوَفَّنَا مُسْلِمِينَ This is something, dimension not given in Surah Taha, which is their dua. You know? What did they ask God? They said, oh Allah, give us patience because Fir'aun is going to punish us. We don't want to fall. And we want to die as Muslims. It goes back to this notion that we spoke about earlier. That is, it's about the state in which you meet Allah. In other words, after you leave this world. Some people might say, okay, I may, I may uh, waste my life for 70 years and ask forgiveness before I die. Well, you don't know you'll, when you'll die. And secondly, asking forgiveness needs his permission. So there are people who are drenched in sins and transgressions will not ask God for forgiveness because they will not even think about it. Or they'll be so despondent, practice yes, that they think God will never forgive them. And that's something that Allah says, I will seal their hearts. Because of their actions, no injustice committed from God, but because of their actions, Allah says, I will seal their hearts. Now, they pray to God, Afrigh here in Arabic, if you've got a vessel and you empty it completely, it's called ifrag. Afrigh alayna sabra means empty, you know, everything that you, can, you want to into our hearts to make us strong, patient ones. Afrigh alayna sabra wa tawaffana muslimin. Now what happened afterwards was interesting because they had dispersed. Musa now had more followers and his teachings began to spread in Egypt. Those around Fir'aun started to advise him. Instead said to him, وَقَالَ الْمَلَأُ مِنْ قَوْمِ فرعون. They said to Fir'aun, are you going to allow Musa disturb your system and make people reject your Lord? Here, just your point, uh, the, 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 the verse says, وَيَذَرَكَ وَآلِهَتَكَ if you have been following in the past, you know that Fir'aun was somebody who said, Ana rabbukumul a'la. I am your supreme Lord. How is it that here, these advisors saying, Musa is challenging your idol? Of course, there's no contradiction in the Holy Quran. It's very interesting. Uh, some of us, Serena, said it's because Yes, as you remember, we talked about Fir'aun, that he believed in, a, in a, a number of idols and that he was the supreme lord, but there are other idols too. So he considered them as, you know, objects of worship as well, but the most respected in his eyes, or what he wanted was himself, yes? Um, and that's perhaps what is understood by wa'a lihatek. Or it could mean Alihat Bani Israel or the Copts. So it is referring to their, their idols, not necessarily Pharaoh's idols, irrespective. Uh, are you going to leave, leave them? Are you, what are you going to do to them? 
فرعون سيز قال سنقتل أبناءهم ونستحي نساءهم وإنا فوقهم قاهرون We will kill their sons and we will enslave their women and we are stronger than them You know when I was reflecting on this verse who I remembered Daesh ISIS Do you know what they do? The poor, you know, Yazidi community and other communities in northern Iraq and in Syria. They go to a village, they kill the men and the boys, and what do they do to the women? They enslave them. Exactly the same as what Fir'aun said, I do. That's it. And uh, you see that uh, uh, this method is something that the tyrants continuously practice. It's more uh, to instill fear in the hearts of people and perhaps to stop their, this conversion process that was going on. Now, a couple of verses and inshallah will end. Musa said to his community, Qala Musa wasbiru, A beautiful verse. Really a verse that brings, brings tranquility for those who understand. You know, sometimes each one of us goes through hardship. We have, sometimes we deal with sisters who think, who complain that their husbands are mistreating them. Sometimes it is people who are in partnerships in business and somebody's taking their rights away. Sometimes people are living in an oppressive state. Sometimes, for example, you find that uh, someone's belongings have been stolen. There are so many areas that we go through real painful experiences, isn't it? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keeps sending these messages for us if we are willing and our hearts are receptive to take them. Here Musa, yes, he's telling Bani Israel, but it's a message to us as well. When Fir'aun started killing the men who believed and enslaving the women, Musa said to them, rely on Allah and be patient. Don't give up. Patience, of course, is of magnificent importance. It strengthens the human being. But then the Quran says, he said to them that Allah will make sure that what he chooses from his servants will inherit the land. Meaning that there will be victory. But you've got to show that you are of the level to attain God's victory, isn't it? But the promise is this. At the end of the day, whether you'll see the victory or not, you will definitely see it on the Day of Judgment. That's the promise of God. You're going through hardship and Allah knows it. If you're patient and if you're steadfast and you don't give up, then you'll see victory, possibly, if you're steadfast. But if you don't see it, know that Allah will reward on the Day of Judgment. No doubt about that. But you know what Bani Israel said? And this is quite interesting as well. They said to Musa, قَالُوا أُوذِينَا مَنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ تَأْتِينَا وَمَنْ بَعْدِ مَا جِئْتَنَا O Musa, before you came, we were tortured. After you came, we are tortured. What is this? You know, it's interesting because sometimes when people uh, go to pilgrimage or they go to ziyara, they go in a particular state. They come back from ziyara or hajj. And they don't feel much different. Perhaps they feel better a day or two. And then they complain. They go, Mulana, Sheikh, Sayyid, you know, this whole emphasis on ziyara or hajj or whatever. I didn't really feel much. What's wrong with the ziyara? Oh, it's all the people that stop me from doing tawaf properly. Or it's the huge numbers that push next to the dariq of an imam. Constantly seeking what? Excuses. And these people were the same. They were saying to Musa, oh, Musa, what difference have you made? When before you came, Pharaoh used to torment us and torture us. Now that you're here, we're also being killed. Yeah? And it is not appreciating and looking at themselves, looking at how they themselves can improve their own situation, given the external circumstances. And... Uh, um, Musa said to them, Allah may, Asa, possibly will destroy your, uh, your enemies and make you inherit the earth. But he is waiting for you to work. فَيَنظُرْ كَيْفَ تَعْمَلُونَ Are you going to change your own situation or are you going to continuously look for scapegoats or blaming others 
or constantly saying, oh, this was the same. Nothing has changed. You haven't really bought anything new. Yeah? It's uh, sometimes, and we end with this, inshallah, we can discuss this part of Surah Al-A'raf next time, but uh, that uh, I'm surprised when I hear people, when I say to them, have you attended Majalis in Muharram, the first 10 nights? Have you attended Majalis in Ramadan? There's normally two kinds of responses. The first is, brother, we've heard it all before. Malana is saying the same thing. He's not bringing something new. I don't know if you've heard this or just me. And then another one is what? Is the idea that, oh, it's, um, it's far, or, uh, you know, um, there's, I, I don't feel comfortable, or this and that, you know, just excuses here and there. But of course, being present in these places brings guidance. You may hear the same message, but being present, in the, being present in the gatherings of the remembrance of Allah and eulogizing the Ahl al-Bayt softens the heart. Ahyu amrana rahimallahu man ahya amrana. Revive our affairs. May Allah revive our affairs. I am not going to hide the fact that I am very uncomfortable with online, with web live screaming, you know, streaming. Very uncomfortable. People say, but you know, there's these ladies with children. No problem. Put a password and give it to the ladies with small children. But we have brothers and sisters who, you know, don't go to the majlis because they want to sit in front of the TV and watch the majlis live with popcorn. <laughs> yes, it happens. Because, oh, well, you know, it's hard. It's, they don't want to put the effort in. Yeah? They don't want to go there and make that struggle. Because that presence there, it's truly transformation. It's truly inspirational. Sometimes, what about the element of meeting others? What about maybe listening to something you might have missed? What about asking about your brothers and sisters? There are all these uh, um, benefits which I don't want to go to. But my point is that the idea is Allah says, let me see you. Well, he knows, but it's for us. Do not just claim and say and use excuses to justify your situation, to justify where you are at this current moment. Inshallah, we will continue with looking at what happened uh, afterwards, what uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did to the Copts, the various punishments that came down, the response of the people of Fir'aun, and then we'll analyze, we'll go back to Surah Taha and analyze the crossing of the sea by Bani Israel and Musa عليه السلام وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلي اللهم على محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين